the tribes are contracted to plan, conduct, and administer those programs that the IHS would norm under other circumstances provide for us because of our status as Native Americans. So what this means is we are contracted to do this on behalf of the Indian Health Service. So we are the Indian Health Service under contract. Because of the division of services, the present arrangement, it's created a bit of a healthcare maze and has diminished accessibility. And that has resulted in disparity in our community and confusion. It's important to point out that the NHS services on the second floor, those are provided with no financial risk to at OHC on first and third floor, those services are at to the Ogala Sushai and the Cheyenne River Sushai. In exchange for contracting to provide the HS. The tribes the full financial So in the event that the system of the tribal contract suffers a financial responsibility, the tribal government is responsible on those shortfalls. What this means right now is full financial responsibility in our health system. We have confirmed this in consultation with other one and with personnel of the community health service. We are active with this. If the couple of communities understand that right now, OHC is raising at approximately $5 million deficit. Now, we don't know the exact breakdown of the shares between the two tribes of financial risk, but for conversation's sake, let's presume that OST controls 60% of the shares and CRST controls 40%. What this means is OST needs to write a check for $3 million. CRST will need to write a check for the remaining $2 million. Now, we're talking about the final solution to this is the bid. But the resolutions that were passed by the two councils in 2018 those mandate detailed financial reports to the tribes. So based on the reports you're receiving from Great Plains, is this accurate? Is this an accurate financial picture? Do you know? If you don't know, that's a problem. Our previous recommendation that we made to the HHS committee was that we investigate, evaluate, and address the financial performance of OHC to minimize the financial risk of the tribes and to minimize the risk of a forced reassumption by IHS. So in reviewing our efforts, right now we do not have a functioning functional government board for OHC. Until we do that, no tribes put that into place. Governance of the South system is the responsibility of the councils. Again, what we ignore, we empower. If the councils ignore the financial disparity at OHC, 
see, you're going to empower them. Now, we went over this in, uh, in our last meeting. Um, we pulled the published mission statement from the Great Plains Health Board from their website. And that mission statement reads to provide quality public health support and healthcare advocacy to the tribal nations of the Great Plains by utilizing effective and culturally critical approaches. And again, that mission statement specifically does not include being the governing body for OHC, nor can it be according to the charter resolutions passed by the Oklahoma Charter and the Cheyenne River. So again, the elders asked that the council investigate, evaluate, and address the government's process. The last time we met, the elders suggested three possible outcomes for your consideration. The first was to do nothing. We don't think that that's a good option. At the very least, there's tremendous financial risk to the tribe and a possible risk of a forced reassumption by IHS. Our second option was to voluntarily retrofit the health system back to the IHS. We also think that is a very poor option to pursue because that we would forfeit our right to self-determine our healthcare system here in Rapid City. The best option that the elders would like us to consider is to put a governing board into place to investigate, evaluate, and address our health system because what we ignore we impact. Now, on here, the Great Health Board has an advocate with an unauthorized body for OHC. We're not talking about that by much. I was just saying we're talking about four of the members, four of those voting members of the seven are executive for the department. We're just a great shot of their everything of the audience. So the executive committee for great claims has adopted the bylaws. This governing body has not been authorized under the tribal resolutions passed in 2018 and 2019. As such, it is an unauthorized body and has no authority over OHC. So our tribes passed resolutions in 2018 and 2019. Don't we already have a governing board for OHC? Well, let's find out. Let's look at those resolutions. OST is the these resolutions, 1842 and 104, 2018, and the year 2018. 1902 and 3-2019 in the year 2019. These resolutions are virtually identical in word and meaning. This was pointed out by James Dragonhoff from the area office. Uh, he observed this in his letter to Great Plains, January 29th of 2019. That is in your hand. Also included in your packet is more detail on the actual phrases and clauses that we reviewed as the other committee to come to our determinations. But we're going to summarize this here. In the 2018 resolutions, those resolutions establish the reporting relationship from Great Plains to the tribes. 
Those resolutions mandated reports to the tribes on a routine and regular basis. They also established the Unified Health Board as the governing body for OHC. They went further to mandate that those routine and regular reports to the tribe shall contain both budget and program information. When you have words in our tribal law, such as shall or will, that means must. It does not mean may or should. It means must. So anything that refers to shall or will means that must happen. Now it's interesting to point out, uh, I think we don't consider what this language truly means when we put it into our resolutions. But we often do put that in. I think I don't know of a single resolution where this doesn't say that. Where nothing in this resolution shall be construed as affecting, modifying, or diminishing, or otherwise impairing the sovereignty of our tribes. It is the elder committee's conclusion that when Rosebud rescinded, they made good use of this clause to make it legal. That's why nobody held them to court. The elders maintained that the Ogala Sioux tribe and the Cheyenne River tribe had similar flexibility for what they may choose to do in the future based on this clause in the resolutions. Now we find a media report from the Native Sun News uh, back in January of 2019, uh, we thought it was important to point this out because uh, they, they have a good understanding of this. So in their article entitled, Susan to Remain Under IHS Control, they made the point accurately that the Unified Health Board, made up of members from the Cheyenne River, Rosebud, and Oglala Lakota Nations, were given statutory oversight of the Rapid City Indian Health Facility on the Sioux Sand campus through a series of resolutions passed by the three tribes and the Pennington County Commissioners. So the, the media interpreted these resolutions accurately. The Unified Health Board was the governing board for the healthcare facility on Sioux Sand campus. I don't think that can be disputed. So let's fast forward to 2019 and see what these resolutions did. This was after Rosebud rescinded their resolutions from 2018. So in the 2019 resolutions, the first thing they did was recognize that the Oglala Sioux Tribe and the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe can self-determine their shares of Sioux Sand without participation from Rosebud. It also established that the Mini Luzahan Wichozani Advisory Committee is the new name for the Unified Health Board. The resolutions never diminished the authority of that governing body. They only changed the name. So the other view is that putting that advisory committee within the structure of the Great Plains Health Board and treating it only as an advisory body has no basis in the tribal resolutions that have the force of law. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> Don't make me nervous. The Elder Committee's view is that Great Plains has taken governance of OHC away from the tribes. 
At Great Plains, the, the MLWAC is treated merely as an advisory body without any real authority. The elders want to point out that the CEO of Great Plains has stated in several tribal meetings that their organization was given full authority with no accountability to the tribes. Uh, there is a statement in your packet from Councilman Gibbons, and we had other people come forward and make those similar statements in our last meeting. The elders want to know, where is this resolution that gave this authority? We can't find it. Because of that, Great Plains determines the composition of the MLWAC and then is not bound in any way to abide by what they want. Under our existing tribal law in the 2018 resolutions and the 2019 resolutions, the MLWAC is the tribal health board for OHC. We recommend that the tribes assert their control over this intertribal health board and that the tribes compose membership, that the tribes formulate bylaws and potentially change the name, make it a real governing board. Get the name advisory out of it. Now the present organizational chart for OHC is buried deep within the bureaucracy of the Great Plains Health Board. It is a spider web. It's very difficult to understand and follow. But essentially, this is how it is. You have the chairman's health board at the top, the actual membership, the tribal chairman. Directly below them is Great Plains administration. And the advisory committee is off to the side somewhere at the semi-dotted line with no real authority. And then on the left, you have uh, Great Plains traditional programs and grants that they operate and OHC. Where is the governing body? Where is that intertribal governing board that that resolution's put into place? Where is our tribal council oversight? It is nowhere to be seen in this organizational chart. Under this organizational chart, OHC is operated as a subsidiary of Great Plains instead of, instead of being accountable to the tribes. The elders believe this is how it should look. Under our Rapid City Tribal Health System. Still chartered by the Great Plains Tribal Chairman. But we would have an Intertribal Health Board in charge. And the governing body would be accountable to the tribes. The health board would hire the CEO. The health board would hire the compliance officer. If the CEO determines they need additional administrative support, perhaps from Great Plains administration, the health board would contract with Great Plains for that administrative support, but still have accountability to the tribes. That's missing right now. The elders would like you to consider a, a board composition that we've come up with. All these members would be elected, popularly elected from the constituency groups. So we would propose three members from OAST, 
three members from CRST. The elders would like the Rosebud tribe to consider joining us and provide three members to our governing board. And then four members from our service area here to give the community a voice at the table. We would also propose three ex officio non-voting members, the CEO, the chief medical officer, and the compliance officer. We would have a total of 16 members on this health board. Of that, we would have 13 voting members. Now, with any health board, you have to have your officers and executive committee. It's customary to have a chair, a vice chair, a secretary, and a treasurer. We would also suggest that the CEO be on the executive committee as an ex officio non-voting member of that executive committee to be able to plead their case, but not necessarily vote on it. Now, health boards have standing committees. Uh, we would propose uh, some of these more typical ones to start with. Of course, the executive committee that we just discussed. And their main functions would be finance and audit, compliance and accreditation, quality issues, risk management and safety, and then any other emergency issues requiring board action in between regular board meetings. Probably also have a bylaws and policy review committee. This one is really important right now, facilities planning and construction committee. There's a lot going on up there right now. And I don't know that the tribes really feel like they have a lot of say in that. So we would have a committee that the tribes would have that say. And then any other committee that the board uh, would like to have in place. Uh, it's usually typical to have a research review committee, and there are others that they may want to do. Boards have to have regular meetings, open, transparent meetings. Must have an annual meeting. We would suggest first week of November. Budget approval meeting every year in July. Get ready for the new fiscal year. And then regular meetings. Most healthcare boards meet uh, once a month. That can be determined at the annual meeting or at the discretion of the chair. The chair can always call a meeting of the board. And then our executive committee would meet in between regular board sessions to handle any emergency issues and develop the board agenda. And then of course our other committees would meet as needed. Facilities and Construction Committee would be meeting quite regularly right now. Now, there's some interim steps that we would suggest to get where we need to go. We would ask the councils to appoint interim board members. And then for those interim board members to have an organizational meeting and appoint interim officers and executive committee. Then that group can draft and adopt bylaws and present them to each of the tribal councils for approval. Then they would hire the key executives for our health system. And then we would hold elections to seat a permanent board. A lot of these interim members might want to run for that, but they need to run for it and be voted in. So again, what we ignore, we empower. Let's empower ourselves. Let's do this the right way. Well, thank you for listening to us today. And we'll open up to questions or comments from today's audience. Mr. Chair, I just need to 
do one thing here that we didn't do before this presentation. Oh, excuse me, I have to walk away. Um, I forgot to explain to you in my previous presentation that we have looked at this whole health system in four, what I call four pronged situation. And as I view it, we have four health systems we need to take a look at. Number one is a 638 contract and the, the way it is operating now. Number two is the IGES, what we call the IGES Rosebud aspect, which has divided and is conquering us. Number three is a master health contract for the Oglala Sioux tribe, which you tribes have given Oglala the lead for for the last 30 years. <clears throat> Number four is a constru construction site that is now going on up at Sioux Sand. There's no oversight. I could not find any oversight of what is happening up there presently. There is no way I see, as Charmaine and I have both read the bonds for the construction site, there is identified on the committee that the chairman of each tribe is represented and one person. For the Oglalosu tribe, it is Tom Brings. Well, I've asked my lecture to talk to Tom. I've talked to Tom. His impression of being on that committee is for the cultural aspects of it. There's more about being a facility than looking at cultural aspects. When, in fact, I was at the Winnebago Hospital and I was part of that whole process of the Winnebago Hospital becoming a hospital and being um, constructed. So I have that kind of experience. And I do know that there's supposed to be a committee in place to look at all the aspects of that facility. Now, what has happened with the Rapid City facility is during the time the Unified Health Board was in operation, the second floor of the hospital was closed. Okay, so that's how come Rapid City ends up with a health clinic because some of the regulation, the regulations of Indian Health Board, of Indian Health Service and Congress say, number one, you have to have an a average daily patient load of 14. That means you have to have 14 patients at all times every day. Number two is that you have to not be accessible to a situation which they say Suzanne was 7.6 miles from regional hospital. And number three is that the staffing pattern of that facility needs to be looked at. So when in fact someone decided, um, my understanding is it was a service unit director from Oklahoma, I can't remember his name right now, and the doctors, you know, our providers don't need to be making decisions. They can, they can incorporate it in and give you recommendations, but they shouldn't be making decisions. So somehow the doctors decided that they did not want to admit patients and come back for rounds. Rounds means that they have to come back and see that patient. So when that happened, they closed down the second floor. So that's why Rapid City ended up with a clinic rather than a hospital. And I know that my grandparents fought darn hard for that Susan Hospital from the time it was turned over from the sanitarium to the hospital. And then all of a sudden it became no, no in-service patient care, which is unfortunate. 
So when I was told that Mr. Steele, John Steele at that time during his administration had met with headquarters in IGES and um, I was here, but I have to admit I was watching point against IGES because I had to bring the lawsuit against it. <clears throat> but um, so I didn't stand up. But at that time, Chairman President Steele had told IGES, okay, when I just told him that he could not meet three of those factors, he said, okay, we'll go ahead and we'll um, do the health center. So that's what's being constructed now is the health center. For the last 30 years that I've been involved in health service, it was always a um, dream, let's say, of the tribal chairman in the Aberdeen area to have Rapid City Susan become a regional hospital for the tribes in this part of the territory and for Winnebago Hospital to be the regional health place for the Eastern tribes. And somewhere we lost that vision and we've lost out now. Somehow we've got to get that vision back in. I was very good friends with Gary Hart before he retired from Indian Health Service because of my working relationship with him at headquarters. And Gary told me, he called me himself, said, Shirley, you've got to step up. You've got to help that community. You know, quit your watching coin and get up there. So I did. At that time, Gary told me I'm retiring, Shirley, but don't let the tribes give up their vision for a hospital. He said it's going to be one floor, but if they still want that dream to come true, it could build, be built up on other floors to become that regional hospital, which 40 years ago that they fought for and kept fighting for year after year. It took 40 years to finally get Congress to allocate that facility, and yet we turned it into a clinic. And my understanding now, I don't know, hopefully you, Ms. Church can answer your questions for you, but it's my understanding that there is some discussion that she would have that whole facility for the health center for the Oyate Health Center. And that there is some consideration that the um, IHS Rosebud would move down to the La Crosse Street facility that she purchased at $1.6 million at whose authority I have no idea, but I question those things and I hope you will too. So with that, I would like to say, I look at this as a four prong responsibility for us, for the people. Number one is the 638 contract. Number two is the IHS um, Rosebud, and then the OSC Master Health contract, and the construction of that facility. With all those things, we will never have a health system that is going to meet the disparity of our people. And we can't diminish those services by causing divide and conquer and division. There's no collaboration, there's no communication, there's no coordination, and there's no cooperation. I have not found any type of memorandum of agreement, no part of an interagency agreement to say how these programs are gonna function. And those are needed in order for us to move ahead. And until that happens, we will be disjointed and we will put our people down to nothing. And we can't allow that to happen. Thank you for listening to me again. Thank you, Ms. Port Thunder. Um, it's almost noon and I have a, a list of about six speakers. Um, we wanna allow them time, maybe two minutes to go ahead and address, that way we could break for lunch. The first one is Skyla Sastors. She's still here, Jackie. Tim. Okay.
Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Diane Fastness, and I'm with the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Um, at the time, I, I'm just listening to everybody, and it's about the Oyate Health Center and some concerns that they have, and you know, listening to Jackie Sears. So I, I guess I'm gonna give a little bit of history about the Unified Health Board meeting. Um, I was the recording secretary for when that Unified Health Board meeting was formed. And I think we met probably about two years worth. Yeah. So a lot of that stuff had to do with the land exchange, um, Susan converting over to the Oyate Health Center. So a lot of that documentation is within my office, the health administration, and those all consist of minutes and any documents pertaining to these whole issues that we're talking about today. So Rosebud had a big hand in, Rosebud Sioux Tribe did have a big hand in, in this unified of uh, forming this um, board and it consisted of OST, um, CRST, and Rosebud. And Rosebud pretty much took the lead on all these issues and concerns, and we all have tribal members at this Susan level at the time and with Oyaki House Center. And um, we had a lapse in time. We didn't, because a lot of that had a lot of transitioning of people going out from council to new people coming in and the same people that formed the people that were in it on that Unified Health Board meeting, those council people were no longer there. So it, it didn't go anywhere and it was kind of, it lay dormant for about three years. So I guess we're back at that point again of trying, trying to unite. And I really think that Uniting, reuniting again is a good thing. Um, Cause I've gotten a couple of phone calls from tribal members as well, you know, regarding um, how they're being treated, employment, unpaid bills, and um, just a lot of other issues. And I really think that, you know, today would be a good start for everybody to, for all three tribes to unite and, you know, try to come to, some type of um, solution or do the start of reforming something to represent our tribal members and to show that support because we do have shares either way for all tribes regarding the um, Oyaki Health Center. And um, I do want the Cheyenne River and OST to know that um, Rodney and Wayne on that resolution for the name change for to support that? Did that come on council for, for approval yet? Okay, but anyway, we, we brought that to the health board and got approved. So we're just awaiting um, for council to approve that resolution to be final. And then we would be on board as a starting point to support the name change for the Oyaku Health Center. So technically, if there's any questions that any new newcomers on board that have any questions, I guess if there's going to be another new meeting in the future, then um, my office would make copies of those minutes for that duration so you can kind of be up to speed of what took place historically and then what we can bring forward to try to um, you know, help our tribal members in a good way. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Um, yep. um, Mr. Bordeaux over there is glaring at me. He looks like he's hungry, so. Well, well um, are you guys don't mind staying for a couple minutes longer or are you guys gonna take a lunch break? Mr. Chair, can I ask that um, maybe we just take a lunch break and then okay. let people sign up, let them know that if they want to speak. Okay, I have a list members. here too, so okay. Wait, let's do that. So they handed out, if you signed in, you got a blue ticket for a drawing. 
Um, but I saw Ryan LeBeau, he kind of went like this. He thought it was a meal ticket, but it, it's for a drawing. So, um, um, Miss, Miss Charmaine, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add something to the, this um, elder committee. Just like you guys have committees. In our constitution, we have a provision for an elder committee. And I'm grateful to this elder committee for all the work they have done. But, but there are uh, provisions and everything have not been approved by the community. We have not been able to have a community meeting for the last year because of the pandemic. And we're hoping we can get one very soon. In the meantime, just to let you know, just like you guys have committees and they bring them to the council floor. Well, this is a committee presentation and it has not been approved by the whole total community. That's one thing. And then the second thing was, there was a statement made that, um, that nothing can be done to save those buildings up at Fusan, and that's wrong. That's wrong. I wish I could have, I have been really sick for this past year. So that's why you haven't heard from me. Otherwise you would have heard from me about 20 times by now, all of you. <laughs> anyway, there is a way for the tribes to stop the destruction that is going on up there. And they do plan on destroying everything except the root cellar. At the last meeting, I handed out this paper it's on the heading is the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. And I handed this out to the OST HHS committee. But during lunch, I'll make some more and I'll hand them out to all of you. And what this is, is that um, oh, about a year ago in May, I contacted the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation because we, we had submitted comments during the public comment period about we even hired it we didn't hire him he gave his work pro bono an engineer to help us look at all those buildings up there and he did and he said we could refurbish and reuse all those buildings up there all except the ones that were really falling down but especially the main hospital lakota lodge and some of the other ones that are still usable instead of destroying everything well what we didn't know was that ihs had already given a contract out like six months before they asked for our public comments. So, um, um, but there is a way. And I, on this paper, it has the email address of Jamie Leutinger, the Assistant Director for the Office of Federal Agency Programs, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. When I talked to them a year, almost a year ago in May, they said there was a programmatic agreement that the three tribes were supposed to sign to say, yes, destroy all those buildings, or no, don't destroy them. And the tribes never signed anything. They never said yes, and they never said no. So IHS took that to mean yes. And so that's why IHS is destroying all those buildings. And they plan on destroying the hospital. They plan on destroying Lakota Lodge. They plan on destroying every single building up there except the root cellar. Now, this is from inside information, and I do not reveal my sources. So anyway, you can, if all three of you tribes would call this, this uh, person, Jamie Leutinger, or email, better yet, email, email Jamie Leutinger and say, no, you don't, you want everything to stop, the destruction to stop up there. They've already taken away the iconic water tower. They've already destroyed about 10 or 15 buildings. There's 27, I think, altogether and they're gonna destroy all of them, except the root cellar. That's the plan. We've seen the plan. That's why we asked this, lawyer, this engineer to help us. And he did. And there was a way to save it using the money that was already appropriated to refurbish, renew, restore those old buildings, and at the same time, build a new clinic. But we want a hospital. We don't want just a clinic. And that's all they're gonna build is just a clinic. They're going to tear everything down right now. All of those buildings that are remaining still are eligible for National Historic Site Preservation, but they're going to destroy them. And once they're gone, then there's no National Historic Site Preservation up there. So you, I would hope, I pray, I ask all of you tribes, all three of you, call or email this Jamie Leutinger and tell them to stop, stop destroying that National Historic Site. Right now, IHS is doing it by itself. Tell them to stop destroying that site right now. And that's what um, Mr. Pedersen didn't, I guess he didn't know that, but 
that's what we have been working on also. We've been working on a lot of other things and I'll get into those later this afternoon. But something for you guys to think about while you're having lunch. There is a way where you could save the existing buildings up there at CSAN right now. Email Jamie Leutinger, call National Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. If you know anybody that works there, any of you know Guy Lopez, who works there at the National Historic Preservation. Call him, he's from Pearl Creek originally. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, we had a couple of, uh, we had a couple of um, tribal council representatives from both tribes, all three tribes come in. So um, we'd like them to introduce themselves at this time. We'll start over here. Russell Eagle Bear, I'm on Jeff, hello. I'm Betsy Washday. My name is Julian Spotted Bear. I am the Pine Ridge District Council representative for Ogallala Zoo Tribe. I'm also the co chair, vice co chair of HHS. Ted Knight Jr., Sharon River Street Tribe from Red Scaffold. Chicago kid from the great state of shock. <laughs> Shit, I'm on this uh, Zoom. Oh, I just joined this Zoom call. I'll call you later. This is Chair. We have a question over here from a person over here. Too. Clifford Lafferty from Rosebud. Okay, um, we will break for lunch, um, come back at 1.30, but I think they're going to do drawings now too, so go ahead, Mark. Mr. Chair, can you please let uh, Councilwoman Swift? How's it going? Oh, she said she'll wait yeah. to Okay. Mark wants to Sorry know that. I have a call about 3.30 today over the roads. Funny. Hey, does everybody have a I'm ticket? Trying to get Dakota. Hold on. They invited me on this Zoom <laughs> call. With that. Shit, I was barely able to just finally get on and then they go for lunch. <laughs> Bryce was talking. First one, one four, six, nine, one, yeah. four, yeah. two. Mom's been bugging the shit out of me. Four, six, nine, yeah. one, four, two. I don't know, other than what Bob told me. I haven't. He said that uh, they weren't paying for bills and. I did hear that. Yeah. And. Uh, 